Welcome back to Spellstorm Miniatures. My name is Jeremiah, and I am one of your hosts this evening. Uh, Dan, my other co-host, isn't going to be here with me this evening, uh, but I do have an exciting episode for you. Tonight, uh, we're going to interview Ron, and uh, we're going to do part two of the I-5 Team Championship uh, tournament that was just recently held um, in Portland, Oregon. And uh, we are a podcast dedicated to uh, miniatures and wargaming and just the hobby side of things. Our goal is to inspire you to play more. And so, uh, Ron, um, say hello to the, to the crowd. Hello, everybody. All right. And uh, thank you for being here with us. You had a unique role in the, um, in the tournament that we just recently played. Uh, for those of you that wanted to hear Dan and my experience, uh, we covered that in episode one. Um, but uh, but uh, Ron, can you fill us in on uh, your perspective as the captain tonight? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but before we do that, I want to get to know you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about kind of your gaming history, where you come from, and and how you get got to the point we're at today. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, my name, again, of course, is Ron, and I've been gaming pretty much all my life. Uh, I started with miniatures gaming, I think, with a lot of folks that have come to War Machine through... Uh, through Games Workshop, um, mm -hmm. 40K specifically is when I initially started, jumped into fantasy. Hey, what uh, uh, what, what 40K army did you have? Uh, I was a Blood Angels player back right in the on. day for 40K. And right on. Then, um, I really liked getting all up in it. And then uh, did Mordheim, Necromunda. And then as soon as, uh, as, soon as I knew Privateer Press was going to be coming up with the miniatures game... Um, I remember playing the Witchfire trilogy module mm -hmm. in uh, in the D and D. That was so, for the three five rules, right? The Witchfire. It was three o. Three o. Oh, was way back in the day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um. So yeah. So I remember. Um, Love the world setting. Um. And so my first character was a, a chaotic, neutral ranger. So that was a lot of fun. But then, uh, as soon as I knew they were doing a miniatures game, I figured I'd check it out. So I was there day one. So I've been playing just over 15 years now. Nice. Uh, exciting times. Um, as far as for what I'm currently running, um, I primarily play four factions. Uh, Signar was my original faction. Um, picked up Protector of Menoth about a year after that because there wasn't a lot of Protectorate players. And I, I kind of like playing things that aren't very common mm -hmm. uh, in our meta. And then uh, when Mercenaries came out with Escalations, I already had a bunch of stuff for two factions, so just kind of picked that up. And then uh, when Hordes released, um, I was originally going to go Circle, but then here in Oregon, there's a lot of Circle players. So <laughs> uh, I jumped over to Scorn immediately because um, there's almost no Scorn players. So that's that's my Hordes faction there. So, yeah. um, But primarily been playing Signar the last year. Yeah. And uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and just put that down and pick up the Menefix again and you know, going back to Protector for a while. Nice, nice. So uh, in my first episode, I was telling how you were the one who introduced me um, in, into War Machine. And, uh, and part of me gets upset with you because you didn't introduce it to me sooner. <laughs> um, but uh, but, but when, uh, when, when Mark III dropped and the new rules came out and the new fresh battle boxes um, uh, how did you feel when, when that came out, like uh, as a game and as a player of the game from the beginning, what, what were you thinking well, when that happened? Uh, I loved it. Um, I was very interested in seeing how the new iteration of the game would go. Cause, um, Mark two, uh, obviously I, from playing the game from the beginning, Mark two did feel a bit stagnant as to what you'd see. So. Uh, basically, every faction you'd come up against, you know exactly what to expect because it's going to be the best of the best of, of mm -hmm. whatever that faction has to bring. So uh, I'm real, real excited now that Mark III's here, and mm -hmm. it, it feels like it's really coming to its own with um, every faction now having gone through a CID. So once the last dynamic update for Scorn hits, then then it feels like everybody's gotten a little something that yeah. that I think brings it to the uh, equal competitive field. At least everybody yeah. should have at least one solid theme that they can back. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just really love the concept. 
uh, of what Mark III had to bring, and just it really kind of broke open the game. So yeah, now you can see so many variety of things, and and that's awesome. Uh, I'm really excited. When when Mark III dropped, it was a, it was really easy for me to get in. Um, yeah. By picking up the battle box, and you know, and you just like, oh yeah, I'll play, I'll play games with you, yeah. and what you have, you 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 held up to your end of the bargain there. Um, I of course started with with Kador, mm-hmm. and and I'm I'm branching out too now. I'm building some scorn, so I might be one of those very few scorn players. Um, when Dan and I started this project, Spellstorm Miniatures, our goal was one of our one of our goals um, is to help just kind of build the community up here um, in the Pacific Northwest. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of great players and over the past few years, I've made a lot of great friends. Um, how do you think, uh, War Machine and Hordes fares? Um, like what's, you, you use the word meta to describe our, 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 our community of players. Um, where are we? Like, are you feel like we have a really good, strong meta? We have a lot of players and things like that. Uh, absolutely. We definitely have, uh, a very vibrant meta. There's a lot of different players. Um, every faction's represented to, to some degree. Um, and when you go to a tournament, you can expect to see a little bit of everything. So I think that's really exciting. And I think that's something that not a lot of areas may have to offer. Mm-hmm. So I think that's something that's very unique to us. And basically, uh, we can we can see things that you might expect at a con just at a at a smaller scale. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a very unique thing to the Pacific Northwest, um, specifically the Oregon, um, Portland metro area, greater meta, um, is that we, we do have a ton of players that are really passionate about the game. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and I, about the Mark III release, um, I love the fact that Privateer Press made everything that you need to play the game in that battle box, because that's yeah. the way I pitched it to you, which oh, is yeah. true. You know, you get the tokens, you get dice, you even get a ruler, a map obviously the figures you just need glue and then you can get started and um that just makes it a really easy pitch to introduce new players to the games and uh, honestly i i have a ton of fun just playing mangled metal just smash robots together because yep. that's that's what got me into the game so yeah i, I was sold on that from the get-go when uh, when ozzy started playing that's how we did it we started with the zero point battle box games and slowly built up and you know and we had a we had a tournament in September, his very first tournament ever, and he wins two games. Like, super proud of him. Yeah, and that's so. that's insane. That's yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, it might not be the same experience for me f- playing from the beginning, but uh, I do know this game has a very very steep learning curve, yeah. and it, I think it really rewards people that stick with it yeah. because um, this game really really is very unique because I think it kind of. Uh, take some elements of like card games and um, strategy games and, and really mash them together. So yeah. uh, I, I always describe it as a hybrid of magic and chess mashed together because you can build combinations with and fun synergies. models. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but positioning, you know, is just as important, if not yeah. more important and, and going for it. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I think is very exciting about the Pacific Northwest is we have the I-5 team championship tournament. And and so teams from Canada and California, Washington, and all over Oregon come and participate. And uh, we just recently had ours uh, two weeks ago, and, uh, and there were 16 teams there. And uh, you were the captain of our team. And I want to hear from you, from your perspective, um, about the event. Um, first, you know, how many times have you participated in it? Kind of what were your expectations going in? How did you prep for it? That kind of stuff. Because um, uh, I, I, I want to encourage people who are listening to this episode to, if they have never played in the I-5 team tournament or team championship um, event, to think about playing next year. Because to my mind, it's the, it's the most fun I've ever had playing War Machine. And so, um, so this is part of a sales pitch, but I still want to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I, I want to give a shout out to Chad for being the head organizer yeah. of the I-5 uh, tournament. And uh, it's, it's awesome. Um, and I want to thank everybody that was participating and helping organizing and structuring it. And just to our community in general for you know, the donations. And yeah, it, it is so much fun. Um, I've done it two years in a row now. Um, nice. And I was captain both years. The first year, I basically went into it with no prep, just Got four other guys, you know, threw together a team, just went at it to have fun to see what it would be like. 
and it was a blast. And the, the thing that I think that really brings people back to the game is just the community of players is just awesome. And the fact that you can, you know, talk to guys after the game and see how it goes, see what you could have done better or, yeah. you know, maybe if they're looking for it, uh, point out some things that can maybe help them into, you know, that matchup if they ever see it again. Um, so that feedback and camaraderie is just amazing. Um, this year, uh, I decided to take a different approach because I wanted to look at having, um, you know, some more success because uh, going 0-3 that first year, uh, it's still a lot of fun. But, you know, I knew that, yeah. you know, with the group of guys we had, you know, we could definitely build upon that. So, And you went 0-3 last year because we had a buy one round. Correct. Yeah. yeah. There's so. 15 teams the year before and uh, we, it went up to 16 this year. So hopefully we can, um, you know, pump that up to bigger numbers next year. But, uh, but still that's 80 guys in a room that are really passionate about this game. And yeah. uh, it, it, it was so much fun. So, um, so yeah, so for the prep for this year, um, I really went at it. Um, I know you, uh, the first year you were on my team, Jeremiah, yeah. and you were really new to the game. Um, <laughs> it was so, my first tournament ever. Yes, yes. <laughs> You'd been playing for, I think, what, three or four months by that point? Yeah. So um, so we definitely kind of offered you up as a sacrifice. Um, I, I went in with the idea of always wanting to pick tables, trying to take the German approach. Our team wasn't quite there yet. So this year I had the strategy of if we won rolls, pick matchups and yeah. tried to figure out what would be the most favorable. Um, I'd listened to a ton of podcasts about how different people approach it. Um, I did build a spreadsheet like a lot of teams do to figure out matchups. Yeah. I did mine a bit differently though. Um, instead of just picking just general matchup of this player versus this player, um, I did break down all the lists. Mm -hmm. So basically everybody had to rank everything twice for their first list and for their second list versus each of the opponents. And uh, I thought that was very insightful. It, mm -hmm. it gave a lot of information. Um, I used a four-point scale last year. I think I'm going to switch to a five-point scale uh, yeah. in the future uh, just to see which more matchups are going to be more even. Yeah, because there are some matchups that just seem like it's a 50-50. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And and those are fine. Like Those are the games I think you want to you wanna have yeah. because uh, in addition to being the most fun, but... Um, you know, that, that's really where the test of skill is. Um, some matchups, it, it doesn't feel good to be the sacrifice or, you know, having to, you know, just pull the trigger and just do your thing. Um, yeah. doesn't necessarily always feel that great. So, um, I think what we really want to do is try to get as many 50, 50 matchups. Cause, uh, I know the guys that we had were amazing and they definitely blew me away with our performance this year. Definitely exceeded my expectations. Um, nice. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so that was kind of my approach for the prep. Um, I know for we had two newer players with you and Dan. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody else had kind of had you know experience from Mark One uh, yeah. going on back as far as for yeah, Eddie's for played forever, Ethan's played forever. Exactly. Yeah. So so they were they were with me pretty much from the get go. Um, so um, I knew that they had a, a plethora of experience. So. Uh, the things that I really kind of focused on our team was getting everybody settled into lists um, a lot earlier so you had a chance yeah. to practice them. And that was huge. That, that I think, made a significant difference with uh, our approach and success and evaluations of how matchups would go. Um, I think one thing that I'm thankful for, for having played for so long is um, I've seen kind of a little bit of everything or something similar to everything, so I at least have an idea of how to approach a, a matchup. So um, I kind of use that experience to kind of push uh, the way the matchups would go. Yeah. So um, so for the actual day of the event, um, we had uh, a lot of great teams that we played against. Um, I just want to thank them. Um, for the I Must Stash You a Question, I believe was our first team that we went up against. Yep. Uh, definitely a great group of guys they ended up uh, playing in the finals yeah. um so so hats off came, to them and it came down to like uh, the tiebreakers essentially to figure out if they were going to be second or third overall exactly yeah. exactly so I, I think they ended up placing third overall yeah um just because of the tiebreakers but definitely a great group of guys um uh as far as for our, our matchups um 
I won the die roll, so I, I opted to, to choose the matchups. Um, I ended up going up against their Kador player, so the I was playing Signar. I guess I should talk about my lists first. Yeah, yeah. Who are your two <laughs> casters? What themes? Yeah. So um, one thing I kind of identified with our team is I felt like we needed a good answer to Grimkin because mm-hmm. um, at least from last year, Grimkin was a really heavy presence, and I know at least in the Portland meta, there's quite a few Grimkin players that are really yeah. good. Yes. Um, so I felt that we needed to have some more good anti Grimkin options. So I opted to go Signar um, for this tournament because I think Signar has a lot of great answers. Kane's your own ace. Uh, <laughs> that's that's really the answer to Grimkin. Um, so uh, I built a Siege 2 list in Heavy Metal, which I know is kind of going against the grain. Uh, but I love it. It's very toolbox. Um, the way I kind of leverage Siege is I, I do use Forge Guard with Mur- Murdoch because as great as Siege 2 is, is in Gravediggers, his best spell is Fury. And it's kind of lost in that theme, in my opinion, because at the end of the day, Trenchers don't hit hard, and he can get them to hit moderate. If you take Forge Guard, PAL 14 Weapon Masters, they'll kill anything. Yeah. And <laughs> the problem with Forge Guard is threat range. Well, Siege fixes that. In Heavy Metal, you also get to take Runewood, so you have access to Pathfinder if you need it. But he also can give plus two to their charge attack rolls, so he has that accuracy corrector, nice. which they can also use. Um, so between a damage buff, a threat range buff, I can do plenty of defense buffs because um, you can put them on a hill. They can dig in for two rounds between Siege's feet and their mini feet with Murdoch. They can go up to defense 16, armor 21 with Arcane Shield with no blast damage. So they're they're pretty hard to remove. So And you're running one unit in that list? You can only, yeah, you can only take one Merc unit. Um, yeah, that's right. Especially that's right. making them faction. Um, but that's definitely enough. Um, I have some other tools, but if you haven't tried Siege 2 and Heavy Metal with Forge Guard, that's my gift to Signar. <laughs> Do it and just nice. rake in the dividends. Nice. Tell me about your other list. So... The, that took a while to figure out what I was going to pair it with because I never felt like I had a disadvantaged matchup with that Siege list. I felt like I had a game into anything. So the problem was trying to figure out, well, what's what's another list I can do that can kind of ask a lot of questions? And Signar has some options, but I kind of took it from a, another approach. Um, I was listening to um, a few different podcasts, and it a few of them had brought up this concept of, well, play two similar types of lists, and then you can just focus on whatever caster is going to be better for the matchup. So I really liked that idea because I really love that siege list, and um, so I ended up taking Haley Two as my pairing, also in heavy metal. The framework's pretty much the same, but instead of Forge Guard, took uh, Iron and Holt, and you know a few other nuanced differences. Um, but that really became kind of like a silver bullet uh, for Grimkin and just kind of Jack heavy lists in general. Mm-hmm. Um, with the exception of Slayers, which we'll, we'll get to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so... So uh, now back to round one. You're, yeah. play, you're playing Kador. Yeah, so I get dropped into Kador. Um, and so uh, it was... It ended up uh, being Vlad 1 Rock. They had a Vlad 2 Armored Core and Vlad 1 uh, Rockets with Winter Guard. So uh, looking at that, I knew that if it was... Armored Core, Haley 2, even with Iron and Holt, would still have some problems armor cracking enough. Um, so I opted to go with Siege because Siege has no problems cracking armor, and he's got volume of attacks with the build that I went with. Um, so he ended up dropping um, Winter Guard uh, with Vlad 1 Rockets, and that was definitely uh, that's definitely a scary matchup if you haven't played it before, but I've played I've played against it before. Uh, not specifically with my siege list, but I had an idea to the approach. Um, bot, or I'm sorry, top of two, he ends up taking my cyclone that I have in the list that's uh, Jack Marshall under Runewood. Um, I had used it to to bounce a trick shot off to to get his marksman, so that already didn't feel good. I was already down one of my heavies just right from the get go. Yeah, but I knew he was going to have problems even with signs importance cracking an armor twenty four centurion. So. I kind of use that as my anchor piece. So it got into a big staring match with his uh, 
Vic- Victor. Vi- Victor, yeah. Yeah, because he had a he took a colossal with that particular build. So, um, so we're going at it. Um, I, I gotta say the MVP of that fight was Kane Zero. Uh, another thing I love about the theme force is that it gives reposition three inches to solos and mechanics. So, <laughs> so Kane Zero with reposition three is amazing. Uh, he killed about 15 winter guard himself that game. So, <laughs> so he, he definitely earned his points back in spades. So there was That's a lot of savage. back and forth. Um, I managed to, uh, we were playing spread the net that first round. Yeah. So I managed to, uh, put up a turret, um, uh, on my flag. And then basically he was just leveraging his high value attacks against, you know, my bigger targets that I had presented to him. So it was just scoring points, um, the whole game. Um, there was definitely a turning point in the game where he managed to get, uh, the victor shot off on ace and catch Kane in the blast, but I was lucky. I was able to focus it down and then the fire went out. So Kane lived and that kind of clinched the game at that point. Cause at that point, the attrition swing kind of, um, decimated him. Hmm. Um, it was really, really well fought. Um, but I, I think if I had to narrow it down to the turning point of the game, that was it. Uh, I ended up winning scenario 13 to six. Um, That's in pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I tend to focus my games on scenario. I, I think a lot of players, when you kind of get to the higher level of play, you kind of stop looking at assassination, which there's nothing wrong with assassination, but uh, scenario is going to be the kind of most sure way to victory. I think the most um, consistent way. So that's kind of the way I kind of approach my games. Um, So round two, we end up uh, going against uh, one of the Ben teams. I believe it was mom's basement. And I end up going into their Grimkin player, which again, uh, as I mentioned before, my Haley two list is kind of a silver bullet to Grimkin. Mm -hmm. So they ended up dropping child. Uh, I ended up, Dropping Haley too, of course, because that's what she was built for. And um, we were playing, I believe we were playing the Pit 2 um, was the scenario for that match. So with that fight, it was it was kind of rough. My opponent made a few small mistakes. Um, you know, he, he definitely knew what he was doing, but the threat projection that Haley presents is is just insane. She yeah. she can alpha better than any other caster in the game. And with the low model count, they're doing um, Dark Menagerie, of course, with with yeah. uh, with the child. And her control effects with a, a smaller model army count is, is still tremendous. So um, I was able to basically alpha twice, um, and he just ran out of models and with the control abilities of, of Haley, uh, I managed to take that scenario as well, uh, five to zero. So, um, so that felt like I was doing my part. Um, unfortunately yeah. we, we ended up losing that round, uh, two to three again. Yeah. So, you know, we had lunch. It was kind of a nice way to, yeah. you know, disseminate information, see how people are going. Dan and I were talking, you know, about, about that. And we felt like, uh, in both rounds one and two, that we still, I mean, we had a chance. Yeah, like absolutely. Like they were, they were really good games. Absolutely, and yeah. and that's that's what I want to see. Because um, at the end of the day, it's it's all about having fun. And yeah, I gotta say, doing the matchup process was was definitely interesting. Um, the spreadsheet, uh, especially my approach, I think, yeah, really helped expedite it on our part. And I think it gave us just a little bit of extra time for yeah. me to kind of go to to you guys and you know give like a, a sentence or two of like. Right. Here's this is kind of a general game plan or right. you know, focus on this, watch out for that. So that you know, really can help. A long time ago, um, you and I were talking about the development of a player. Mm-hmm. And and I, and you said there was basically three phases of the development. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember what they all were. One of them was learn your models. Yes. Um, the other one was learn your opponent's models. But I can't remember which stage those are. Yeah, absolutely. So I do think there's different stages to yeah. mastering the game. Yeah. So the first stage is just learning the basic rules of the game. That's what it is. That's and the that, first stage. That's that's the quickest stage because yeah. rules are rules. You play a couple of games, you get the gist of yeah. how things move. You learn what so a charge so does. I mean, it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how to make attacks, what the stats actually mean. The second step, and this takes a while. 
Um, and yeah. you know, it varies from person to person, but that's learning what your stuff does. Yeah. So what are the combinations that you can pull off? Yeah. Um, you know, what having is, stats memorized, having stats memorized, what's going to be kind of effective combinations, things like that. Yeah. Um, and that I think in the grand scheme of thing doesn't take that long either. Uh, especially with it takes reps is what that does. It takes it, reps. It takes practice yeah. and it's, it's not immediate, but that's something I think most people can, can master within a couple of months to a year. You know, it kind of, I, yeah. it varies depending upon schedule and stuff like that, how many reps people can get in. Um, and, and just the, personal abilities of, of individuals, you know, people sure. learn different rates and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but I think in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't take that long. And then the third stage. The third stage is the longest stage. And this is, this is the thing that can take people typically a couple of years is learning what your opponent's stuff does. Because mm-hmm. when you're new to the game, you can lose just simply because you didn't know that an opponent could do a certain thing and that yeah. can lead to an assassination or change the game state in a way that you can't recover to win. Right. And that's rough. That's, that's the learning curve people that are new to the game yeah. really have to learn. See, and I, and I bring this up now because you're talking about the spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. And, and by being a, a member of your team, mm-hmm. what the spreadsheet did for me was it, it encouraged me to look at specific lists. I started, looking, I started actually kind of doing homework and started looking at all these other factions and casters and, mm-hmm. and what the theme benefits to give them and things like that. That really, really became, I think, a defining moment for me in ushering me into possibly that third stage of development as a player. You know, and um, that's great. That's great. And that makes me so happy to hear because, you know, if if you can learn from your games, you know, win or lose. And I think you learn more, a lot more about losing. um, You know, those lessons kind of stick with you more, I think. (laughs) Um, (laughs) At least it does for me. And I've lost plenty in my time. Like I said, playing 15 years, I've lost plenty of games. Yeah. Um, But yeah, those are the lessons I think stick with you the most. Yeah. And, um, yeah, if you can start to evaluate matchups, what things can do, um, you can kind of identify, you know, um, things can be kind of similar even in different factions as far as for approaches and, yeah. you know, things to watch out for because um, every every caster can present unique things and every faction presents unique things. So there's just so much to learn with this game. Yeah, But if you can master that third, that third step, that's when I think the game really kind of opens wide up, and that's mm-hmm. when you really start pitching those those yeah. fights. Um, so once you get to that level, um, uh, to me, I think that's when you really start playing the game because then you can, then you're you're on an equal footing with yeah. everybody at that point. So you know yeah. that you're not going to get gotcha. You know you you know that you got to approach games in in different strategic ways, and that's where the chess chess match part of it comes into it. Yeah. So. So then going back to the tournament now, mm-hmm. you know, we had lunch in between round two and three. Yeah. And I really feel like that was a turning point in our tournament as a team. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we got to sit around a table and, and talk about that very thing. And and so tell why don't you get us get us out of lunch and get us in the round three. Yeah. And, and I gotta say, um, even though we lost the first two rounds, you know, we it, they were close, you know, two three and especially with some games that could have gone one way or another, you know, dice happens, scotches happen, things like that. But, um, but the fact that they were close games gave us a lot of, I think was very encouraging. And the fact that, um, you guys were really pulling your weight as well. Um, so that, that was really, really good to see because, um, because the first year I, I was kind of the only one winning matches. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, which, which obviously, you know, it feels good to win yourself, but like, yeah, I, I'm way more happy when you guys are winning fights because you know it, the, there really is that that team aspect and uh, as someone that you know did you know sports in high school and stuff like that you know you get kind of a, a unique mentality when you actually join like an organized team so yeah. um so it was nice to kind of uh have that experience kind of come back you know yeah. all these years later <laughs> so um so coming back to it yeah we had a nice discussion and then we approached um uh, round three against the second uh, Ben team. So they, I know they had two teams there, so we played yeah. both of them. That's right. Um, I think they were the Prairie, Prairie Wrinkle Pandas. That I believe sounds familiar. The, yeah. I believe that's the name of the team. Yeah. Um, a lot of great guys. I ended up going against uh, Gatsby 3 Nine Slayers. 
Ah, uh, yes, so, the infamous right, Gaspy right. Three Nine Slayer list. And so, uh, so I had actually played against uh, Nine Slayers. I've I've been bugging one of our our players to, to let me try it out, but he he did not feel like going up against my Signar. Um, <laughs> he kind of so, knew how that would end. Well, you know, <laughs> it, I, I I do have a lot more reps than Ethan on that. Um, but uh, in general, as far as for for just general games. Um, so, but I had an idea. I thought a lot of, about the matchup, and I had really debated dropping Haley into that because it's a low model count. It is a jack spam, but I felt that with Haley, the the list build I had only had three heavies in it. I, I just wouldn't be able to attrition them hard enough mm-hmm. um, in order to come back. So I went with Siege because I knew he had volume of attacks. Because as I mentioned before, Pound fourteen weapon masters kill anything. So, yeah, they do. <laughs> so with the roll off, uh, I won the die roll to go first. I opted to go second. Um, uh, I think back to that if I should have gone first because he did tear up a ton of board space. But I felt that I needed to hold him off on scenario long enough for mm. me to be able to to not lose on scenario for me to attrition back into the game. So by going second, you had a little more control in that. Exactly. Because the one thing he doesn't have is guns. And the one thing Signar has is a lot of guns. Wait, wait. Signar? A shooty faction? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) And then, uh, especially with my build, um, you know, having Cannon Ace, Triumph, and a lot of others, um, that's a lot of quality range shots that I have. Yes. And another another shout-out to Siege 2 Heavy Metal, if you put fire for effect on that turret, that turret does some work, folks. So just saying boosted PAL 14s with boosted high explosive shots, very, very nice. So with that, um, you know, he ate up a lot of board space. Um, I crippled one of his Arc No Jacks, bottom of one, but not too much happened there. Round one, he kind of pushed up hard. I tried to present a situation that I didn't want to offer him too much, but I knew he had to commit into me because he was trying to get me out of the scenario game. So I have my forge guard. I end up putting arcane shield on them, and then I kind of spread them out in a in a ranked format where I have three of them up front, and then about an inch behind them, another three lined up, and so on and so forth. So I kind of rank them up that way. Um, I put down a covering fire template in a forest to to prevent the Opponent from just walking in without damage, give him a mm. second to think if he wants to take a few points because I knew I wasn't going to do any sort of serious damage, or, or so I thought. Um, and uh, that's ominous, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so he ends up sending in a slayer. Um, and I, I actually spike the dice, do six points of it on the way in just through the covering fire. Um, he goes to make his attacks and he's gonna hit defense 10 dwarves, but the arm 21 actually kind of threw things off so he kills one fails to break armor in the second fails to break armor again on the third hit with the tusks and then buys another one fails to break armor so he only kills one dwarf with a slayer he then oh, has wow. to send in the second slayer and he ends up killing off the, the other two but he had to commit two slayers suddenly to, to do that um you know being able to to put fury onto the forge guard giving them the charge bonus to hit um, they took those two slayers. Um, yeah. So the way I came back in that game was uh, bottom of two, I took four slayers out. It's all said and done. Um, Triumphs, um, heavy gunfire basically took out a slayer, you know, after a couple of rounds of shooting. Um, and then my centurion basically took out a slayer and then Siege okay. helping out the forge guard. So that's uh, six gun. I'm doing well, the math in my head. Well, the, I'm just saying how I got the four. So, oh, oh, I so, see. Got so, okay. so they they each accounted for for Slayer, okay. and then my Forge Guard, you know, finished off the other two. So that's so that um, brought that down. Um, he was really jammed in, but I managed to free up the board enough. Um, I did some Thunderbolt shots, kind of moved some things around as well with Kane. Um, made sure I killed off his solo that was on his flag. Um, so I managed to score one at least and, and take up a point lead at that. Um, that, that was the only time I ended up having the point lead <laughs> in the game. Um, we do a lot of back and forth. Um, bomb of three, I don't end up killing any more slayers, but I basically crippled three to the point that they're 
not able to do anything. Mm, They're not mm. effective anymore. Okay. And at that point, um, even though he was scoring steadily on points at that point, um, the fact that I think went second really set the edge because he managed to get up to the, the the game ended with him having four control points and with me just having the one. But hmm. uh, if I had focused, I could have cleared my flag and um, basically start swinging to a point where I was scored points where he just ran out of stuff to contest. Yeah. So I, I wasn't going to end up losing on scenario. He ended up having to commit Gatsby to try to, to clear his own to make sure he could try to push for the scenario win. He puts him within 15 a siege, which is a, a big no-no. Uh, <laughs> however, I decided, well, I'm going to soften him up, take some boosted gunshots, and I just spike high. And between Kane Zero and Triumph, just just put down um, Gatsby oh. that way. So Siege didn't even have to activate. He, he didn't have to. But uh, but I knew I, I had Gatsby at that point because yeah. if if you're all not familiar, Siege 2, he's got a 15-inch, you move into it, I will kill you, uh, kill yeah. you threat. That's always the hard hard part when when you're playing so hard for scenario and you know and and then you just just get a touch too close you know in this case the gas player yeah, yeah. And, and we talked it out and had he not done that um i had enough resources there to clean off everything yeah. that was contesting my flag i it it wouldn't have been very much for me to score that zone as well yeah and i, I was contesting his zone so he only had his flag um, to score, but I would have been scoring two, and he basically ran out of stuff to be able to contest that yeah. zone and flag at that point. So I would have just started running away with the scenario with me being just able to score more points than sure. him. And uh, I had more things I could do work because he was just down yeah. to two Slayers at that point and Gatsby and yeah. like two solos. So it was it, it was kind of a, a hard situation for him. So, so end of end of the first day... You're you're up three and zero. The team won that round, round three. Yeah, yeah, four so to now, one. So now four awesome. to one. Yes. So now the team is now one and two, mm -hmm. and uh, and we generally go home happy. Yeah, um, it, it was nice to yeah. see all that work we put in start to pay off there yeah. in that round. Um, yeah. And I think with the matchups that we decided, <clears throat> like we knew we were going to have one really bad matchup. That really set up the other ones, and and that's how it went. That was yeah. the game we lost, and the other matchups. You know, you guys did your part, and, and we managed yeah. to take that. And I was so proud of everybody because everybody at that point had at least one win. Um, some people had two already at that point. So, yeah. so like that, that just made me ecstatic. So, when did you find out what our um, uh, opponents will be the following day? Did you find out Saturday night? I did. Um, when we got home, um, Chad had managed to post in the COG Facebook group um, what the teams were going to be for, as far as for the matchups. So um, um, so I had like a little bit of time to think about it, but I really just kind of crashed because we had an early morning to, to finish up the last round. So, um, so I thought about it a little bit, and then you know, most of us carpooled together. So we talked about what we would be um, fighting against uh, it was salt miners to the resultaning mm -hmm. um, and they were out of uh, the bay area yeah oh and uh just just as a quick note it was uh, recon was the scenario we were playing in that third round oh so, yeah. yeah so fourth round um we were playing invasion um i end up going against their circle player who they had an una two and a kruger two um pairing mm. uh, i've played that kruger two pairing or I've played that Kruger two fight with Siege, and that is heavily advantage for Siege, because those Sentry Stones just crumble under Triumph, mm -hmm. and once they lose the Sentry Stones, they lose their ability to contest Scenario. So then they have to push in, and there's a lot of angry dwarves and a lot of big scary jacks <laughs> to 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 kind of go in on that. So so I, I've played that fight. Um, even with Windstorm, it's a really delicate balance because, because again, um, Kruger wants to get within 14 of my guns to reduce their range, but he's also got to stay 15 inches away from Siege, and that that's that's a really hard dance for yeah. for him yeah. to do that because if if he doesn't, again Siege pops and and goes after him. And, and again, I got to say the other thing I love about that heavy metal build is having access to Pathfinder on Siege. So the fact that he can actually move through forests and stuff like that and really get his full 15-inch threat wherever the board is, um, I think is really, really big for that matchup as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. But uh, so did my, you end up dropping Siege then? I, I knew I was going to play Siege because yeah, okay. if he played the Una match, I still felt really good into it. And he ended up dropping Una, and I told him as soon as he did that, I'm like, "You did the right pick because I played that Cougar match, and yeah. it is very bad for Cougar." So I gave him kudos for that. Um, he had been playing a long time too. He had been playing for I think well over a decade. Okay. As well, I think he said he started in '05, so almost as long as me. So. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I ended up playing against their captain, so it was a captain off. Um, right on. I did right. not know that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, I knew I, I had a, a challenging opponent ahead of me, and he played really well. Um, so we, um, set up, go for positioning. I end up putting the turret in the middle square zone. Um, there's a big force in the middle, but I kind of had an angle to sh- shoot as his objective with the turret, um, put fire for effect up on it. Cause again, that's money and you know, he's positioning, he kind of abandons one zone pretty much altogether and is kind of doing mm-hmm. a kind of a refused flank formation where he's getting ready to push into to the opposite zone. Yeah. So I kind of align my forces to, to be able to, fight there but i do commit quite a few resources to to the zone that he's abandoning and you know based on the the way that was lining up i knew i'd have siege in that zone if i was going to score it so he ends up contesting it with a with a bird that that becomes important later on because i end up sending siege in to kill that bird um and then i just couldn't get back far enough because the thing about una is she's a really awesome assassination caster. And um, as we're going, um, I end up spiking a, a damage roll on his objective. Um, well, the the objective I hurt with the turret, but more importantly, he had wrong eye right next to the objective. I spike high, and he ends up having to make a tough check, which he does end up making. Hmm. I end up dropping a few trick shots, and eventually one of them I just roll an eight on damage, and that finishes him off. So that really kind of forced him into a bad spot. Uh, uh, scenario wise because yeah. he had even less resources and he was down on the peace trading at that point so he knew he had to go for assassination and I, I made a critical mistake which I knew at, this was at the uh, bottom of three because I ended up uh, going second again um, I end up uh, forgetting to move my squire which I had totally intended to move to block one of his landing spots for a bird and that ultimately is what did me in because he was able to get his birds in. First one managed to barely not kill Siege because Siege is tough. But um, actually, no, I don't think I required a tough roll at that point. But he had a second bird that he was able to send in. And yeah. between Flank, Weapon Master, he had Primal on one of the birds. They just have an insane output. So even yeah. though I was camping three, um, the fact that he had two birds gave him just enough for him to be able to to get siege. Yeah. Um, I, I've been assassinated by those birds before. Yeah. Um, something was really interesting. Um, that round, our team went four and one. So everyone else, no, no, we went, uh, three and two that round. Oh, we did go three and two that round. Yeah. Cause oh. me and Dan, I believe lost our, our matches. Oh, but, okay. but still, then I, I had that fact wrong then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But still okay. everybody else, um, managed to, to yeah. carry out their games yeah. and we still won the round. So I was just, I was really yeah. blown away by the the performance of the team. Yeah. And so, so here's the funny thing. Yeah. So that was you know the only game you lost that round, and yeah. um and so there, um I had, um I was able to win against my opponent, um in a top of two, and um and so we were both done and we were just sitting there talking about about mm-hmm. our games and things like that, and and so he walks, he, your opponent walks over to mm-hmm. to where we are. And he and he goes, he goes. I think he thought we were playing a real game, because you know because you were playing so hard on scenario. Yeah. And you said you committed siege to go after the bird. Yeah. In hindsight, knowing that assassination would, would be forthcoming, would you have forsaken that that zone, or do you think you still make that move, but just remember the squire and things like that? No, I, I think I made the right play. Except okay. for the fact that I forgot to move the squire. There it is. Because the squire, okay. I had totally intended to activate to, to block that off. Because yeah. had that squire been able to go there, he has only one bird that can get on me that can attack. And that wouldn't be enough. And at a 14 defense, 18 armor, the defense part doesn't matter as much. Because with primal, he's just going to hit. 
because yeah. he'll he'll be at a mat effective ten. He was gonna get the weapon master stuff, but at eighteen armor with eighteen boxes and tough with me camping three, I I felt pretty good about yeah. being able to survive that. But the mistake I I did was not moving that squire, gave him a landing spot for the bird. Even even despite that, I I still had a chance to. If I got a lucky roll with the turret because it had sentry fire, so where he had to place the bird, I still got a shot off on it. Mm. Um, I didn't roll the right column, so if I'd have been able to kill one of his aspects, uh, especially if it was spirit, yeah. that that would have that would have swung it because that was the bird that had primal. So okay. if he had no spirit, then he would only have his three initials. Um, he wouldn't have had the two extra attacks, and then he would have had to send in a bird that didn't have primal. So even though it would have uh, flank. Um, still being six off on the beak and seven yeah. off on the others, you know, is is yeah. is a rough spot for that bird to, to be in. It's it's those those little details, yeah. you know, that come with m- many years of playing, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, I I I think I made the right play, except for the fact that I made one mistake, um, and that one mistake cost me the game. But that's that's yeah. what's beautiful about this game too, because. Yeah. Um, you know, looking about it, like I was really proud of the way I approached it because if I didn't push scenario, you know, then there could have been a lot more back and forth. Right. It would have been a completely different you know, game. I- exactly. Yeah. Um, so I would have. Yeah. So with me killing that bird, that's what allowed me to claim that zone and put him in a position where he wasn't going to be able to, yeah. to, to win on that area at all, as opposed to. Just continuing to contest, continuing to contest, and then waiting for another yeah. opportunity to come at me where I might not have as many pieces to protect Siege. But, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, and and the fact that it's a team tournament. And yeah. so one loss doesn't actually mean anything exactly. in the grand scheme of things because we still won the round. Exactly. And and like so, I said, I was, I was so proud of everyone. Yeah. And you guys played great. Um, Thank you. I think every game that round ended with assassination whether we won by assassination or we lost by assassination. Yeah, that's right. Round, round four it, it, was it the was, assassination it, round. It, it was pull the trigger for everybody on that on that time around. So uh, do you think you will uh, pr- play the part of captain again next year? Yeah, if you guys want me to. Uh, well, I have a lot of fun. Well, with yeah, that. I think, of course I, I do. Think you guys but was it a rewarding experience that. for you? Absolutely. Yeah. My wife will disagree. Um, <laughs> I spend a lot of hours... Going over matchups, yeah. um, looking at lists, because um, yeah. I, I really love that uh, yeah. analysis aspect. Um, really working on that spreadsheet. I even took the opportunity to. I even took the opportunity to figure out if we had to put up a player first, mm-hmm. um, deciding who that player would be beforehand, just so we could just get to it right away. Yeah, and kind of, uh, in a sense, put the clock on the opponent. So. Yeah. Uh, even though there's not like a hard clock in the matchup process, there's there's a bit of a time frame before people have to get started. So, right. um, and yeah, our matchup process went super quick, and I think we did the right choice. Um, I did my part in winning all the roles, so I chose all the matchups <laughs> for all four rounds. So all that time and effort I spent deciding who we'd put up first was not used at all. But <laughs> I did my part in winning that die roll. So. Yeah. There you go. But well, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up this this uh, this conversation this little interview here. Um, I want to th- say thank you for, um, for coming out and for talking about your experience. Um, our goal, of course, is to try to inspire um, more players uh, to play more. Uh, before we go, I want to ask you what's on your hobby table. Yeah, I've got three toros I need to finish building. Yes, you do. But since I'm going to be playing protector for a while, maybe I'll just get around to putting my sev zero in. But okay. I'm gonna run double. Sev, I think, at the tournament. So okay. I'm not even in a rush for that. So I, I got some things I got to build. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that tournament you're referring to is we have a regional tournament on uh, November 10th, and it's uh it's actually a week from tomorrow. Um. Well, I guess week from this coming Saturday. And and uh and it's a it's a fantastic event. It's 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 the space is huge and uh, it's it's cost. It's only like ten bucks, I think, to register, and so you'll want to register at the Cog Collective um, forums. There's a there's an events page there, and uh, and you can you can register and you can participate. Um, this weekend is War Machine weekend. Um, are you gonna follow any of the games? Yeah, I'm gonna definitely take a peek at the lists. Um, cool. It, it's gonna be interesting because 
you know, to see what what's being popular, um, especially with Circle just having their dynamic update release. Yeah. Um, and even Legion with the change to the Archangel, I think, is going to be interesting to see if that starts making its way into lists as well. I would love to see the Archangel on the table. Absolutely. Yeah, it's I, a gorgeous model. Obviously, I, I'm really waiting for that Scorn dynamic update. Yeah. Because Immortals and, and the whole Exalted theme was one of the big things I yeah. loved about Scorn, and that really got me into that. That and the Pain Givers. Yeah. The, the Praetorians and Cataphrats, not so much. Hmm. So I, I do think yeah. that... Imperial War hosts should really just have pain givers like the blood runners and all that because it's kind of rough having only six casters you can actually yeah. run with the blood runners is kind of a, a rough spot for it but yeah um, but yeah I'm really excited to see those toys and I think Morgul two with that telemetry and um, you know that and Marketh yeah. having a couple mortalities you can get out every round fairly reliably. With the new Hydra, I think that's going to be a thing. It's so be vicious, yeah. So if people uh, hear this and start running that, you're welcome, and I'm sorry, uh, depending upon <laughs> what, what side of the coin you are on that. <laughs> Very good. Hey, did you order it? Did you order any Supreme Guardians? I haven't yet. Um, like I said, I'm, I, I've been running Signar really hard for the last year, and um, surprisingly for quite a bit of Mark One and Mark Two, I was actually more of a Protectorate tournament player. Okay. So I really kind of want to whip them back into shape, and um, I think okay. I think Severius both one and two are very very underutilized, especially with Severius zero coming out. So I think a lot of people are kind of ignoring, you know, the the old man of the faction. But uh, I I, I want to I want to teach some youngins uh, some lessons there. I think very good. I'm sure I'll be the recipient of some of those lessons. Maybe if you're lucky. Maybe. Well, uh, once again, I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you out there in listener land, uh, my co-host Dan says hello. Uh, you can find us at spellstormminiatures.com. Uh, we have a blog. We have a YouTube page where we're going to be posting battle reports and and uh, and just doing general hobby discussion and things like that. And uh, if you like us, uh, uh, share it and uh, let people know. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to giving you more content. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye.